All right, we are continuing in Romans chapter 3. We are looking at Romans in the light of faith and works together. And uh, I will remind you that the first, I think, and the most important understanding is that Romans is drawing a distinction between Jew and Gentile when it speaks of works of law or deliverance through law. It is talking about the law, the law of Moses, not just some abstract idea of law as if we were not under any law or did not have any commandments to keep. Um, and I think that's the chief misunderstanding in the world. Chapter three continues to bear it out. We spoke last time about chapter one, outlining how people became something that they shouldn't have um, in the world without God and without knowledge. But chapter two drops the hammer on the Hebrews among them saying, well, but you should know better <laughs> and you should do better and you cannot be doing these wrong things in a different name or under a different authority and say that you are right. That cannot be. Just because uh, idols are wrong doesn't mean that you can rob idols temples. And so that drops. And in the end of chapter two, we read that he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. He is a Jew who is one inwardly, whose circumcision is of the heart. So we're looking at sincerity of the person. Well, chapter three continues this discussion and we'll just walk through these together so that we can understand them. I think it's really the best approach. Uh, chapter three begins the discussion. Well, what advantage then has a Jew? What's the value of circumcision? Well, right. If it's true that Jews and Gentiles are all of us confined under the same condemnation of, of sin, well, what's the advantage then of having an Israel? But there is much in every way an advantage. First thing is verse two, to begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. That is to say the utterances, the words, the scripture, the Bible, that is from the Jews. And I think it's important to remember this, that you know, in that sense, we are all Jewish because every single one of the authors of the Bible was Jewish. All of these records were compiled by the Levites, uh, you know, by Moses or other Levites along the way uh, through the Old Testament. And what in the first century was accepted as the inspired word of God, the scriptures, was identified and known and and held on to, preserved, if you will, by the Jews. Um, this is the reason why uh, we ought to reject the deuterocanonical books, as they are sometimes called, or apocryphal books, as they are other times called, extra books of the Bible, like uh, Wisdom of Sirach, Tobit, uh, Bell and the Dragon, things of this nature. They should be rejected, Maccabees, because they were written before Christ and yet the Jews whom Christ tells us uh, have been entrusted with the oracles of God did not accept those books. It was up to them at that time and they said no. So they should not be part of the Bible. Now, since that time we do have the writings of the apostles, all of whom are Jewish as well. And this is uh, something to remember that we would not have the truth. We would not know the truth. We would have no Bible if it had not been for ancient Israel. We all owe a debt of gratitude to ancient Israel for this. They have indeed a, a great advantage in that regard. <clears throat> However, he said, what if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? Well, by no means. That is the case. 
there are always going to be people who do not do what is right. They hold the office and they ought to do right. They ought to know better, perhaps you would say, and they don't. That doesn't mean that the office is bad. That does not mean that God is bad or that authority is bad. You can find bad husbands. That doesn't mean that marriage is bad. Uh, you can, you know, you can find bad fathers. That does not mean parents should not have authority over their children. You can find bad presidents. That doesn't mean we should have no leader. It's, um, there's a difference between attacking the structure, attacking the organization, the authority that God has put in place, and questioning the person who holds that office. Similarly, Israel uh, were faithful, but there were some who were not faithful. Does that nullify the faithfulness of God will know. Let God be true, there everyone were, though everyone were a liar, as it is written that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. That's what David said when he was uh, facing the penalty of having murdered Uriah the Hittite and committed fornication with his wife. Um, he said that it was his fault. He had chosen to do it. It wasn't God's fault. God prevails in judgment. What he, God has said is right. That's all he's getting at. Even though he himself did not faithfully discharge his duty in that particular case, he acknowledged that that was his own choice. He did wrong and God was right. And that if God is going to be judged by anybody, he must prevail. He is always right. His word is always right. So, on the one hand, we do have the oracles of God by means of the nation of Israel. On the other hand, the fact that sometimes people don't do right despite their office doesn't have anything to do with God and shouldn't stop us from doing what is right. That's what we're getting at. The ninth verse continues the thought. Are we Jews any better off? Well, no, not at all. We've already charged that everyone, Jews and Greeks both, are under sin as it is written. And now we quote from the Old Testament multiple places that show, yeah, no, there's more to it than just being born an Israelite. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. In another place, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. In another place, the venom of asps is under their lips. In another place, their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Another one, their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. The way of peace they have not known. And finally, there is no fear of God before their eyes. These are all from different places in the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures. Which is to say, they were all not about Gentiles. That's what you can find when you look at these passages. They are not about Assyria and Egypt and Moab. They're about Israel. What was happening inside the camp of the Israelites. They say everybody is charged with sin inside and out. So what is that advantage? Well, in, in the case of sin, there is no advantage. If, if you're, you know, the fact that you were, that your, your parents were servants of God, and, and today we would say they were Christians, and sometimes people say you were raised in the church, whatever that means. But no, if your parents were Christians and they taught you the truth, and you learned these things from uh, childhood and you grew up, you are the Jew of Romans. You're the person who is in that position, who knew the scriptures, who was instructed, who was brought up this way, who did not uh, know other things, who did not enter into the world's religions, various and sundry idolatries out there. You are the Jew, if that's how you were raised. And those of us who were raised by, well, the idol idolaters and other, you know, various and sundry things out there in the world, we are the Gentiles. Um, that's the meaning of this. 
So having been raised around the righteous, it's not a way to ensure that you are yourself righteous. <laughs> That's all. The world, of course, is in sin, but sometimes Christians are in sin as well, and that has to be dealt with. Judgment starts with the house of God. So now we look at 19 and 20. We know now that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes only the knowledge of sin. Here's where things start to go off the rails for people, if they don't understand what the law means here. Now, I'm lucky my translation says the law. They didn't capitalize the L. They should have. This is not about law in general, which people believe. What people think this is saying is whatever you know, commandment keeping says, <clears throat> it says to those who have to keep those commandments. But by works of commandment keeping, no one will be justified. That's what they believe, but that's not what it says. What it says is the law, the law of Moses. It's not saying you don't have to obey God or you don't have commands or that you don't have a law. It's just not that law, the law of Moses. We have today, according to James, the perfect law of liberty in Christ. Perfect meaning complete. It's the final thing. Moses was a setup. Jesus is the perfect. In him, we have the perfect law of liberty. This is the truth. We are under law. We're never without law in an abstract sense of law. We are, however, beyond the need of the law of Moses. He's not saying that it only applies, that, that obedience only applies to people who have been given commands, or that no human being is capable of keeping commands. He's not saying that at all. He's saying the law of Moses was only given to those who are under the law of Moses, that is, the Israelites. The Greeks were not expected to keep the law of Moses. That's all. Among other things. But the works of the law, meaning the law of Moses, will justify no human being. Which is to say what Hebrews said, the sacrifices of bulls and goats can never take away sins. In them, there is only a constant reminder of sins. If they could purify, if they could remove sins, then wouldn't they have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers would have gone away with clear conscience? That's what Hebrews is arguing, and it's exactly the same thing here in, Rome, in uh, Romans 3, uh, 20. Through the law comes knowledge of sin, not justification. Even if you offer, you can't get forgiven that way. Well, how do you get forgiven? That's verse 21. Now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law of Moses, although the law of Moses and the prophets bear witness to it. What is the righteousness of God that has been manifested apart from the law of Moses? It is, verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Now here is where things get tricky. Um, you know, my translation of verse 21 says uh, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, but they left that L cap, uh, lowercase l. And then in the very next phrase, although the law and prophets bear witness to it, they capitalize that L. Well, it's the same word. They should all be capitalized because they're all talking about the same thing, the law of Moses. Not this abstract concept of law as if you don't have to obey God. That's what they believe, but that's not what it says. 
It never has been. The law of Moses. What's tricky about this is, unfortunately, um, a lot of teachers in the churches, uh, uh, based on my observations, based on my readings of uh, historical um, articles, historical debates, uh, recordings, things of this nature, I, I've looked at this. A lot of teachers in the church, the real church, um, have tried to go and have tried to deal with this problem um, by arguing that faith um, and works are not opposites in the in Romans, but actually in Romans they are because in Romans we are specifically talking about the works of the law of Moses, not keeping commandments. That would be James 2. Faith and works are not opposites if you're talking about works the way that James 2 is talking about works, keeping commandments. Or 1 John is talking about works, it's keeping commandments. Of course, faith and works go hand in hand there. But in Romans, he doesn't talk about works that way. When he says works, he means the works of the law of Moses. Circumcision, kosher eating, um, you know, new moons and festivals. That's what he means, or sacrifices of animals. And in fact, in Romans, faith and works are opposites. Now, this is um, a problem when you begin to try and interpret it because you are tripping on their argument. <laughs> Uh, if you try to make faith and works go hand in hand in the letter to the Romans, they don't. They're specifically set up as opposites. And that starts right here at verse 20. Notice, by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But, verse uh, 22, the righteousness, which is the justification or the justice of God, through faith in Jesus, or uh, the, the justice of God has come through faith in Jesus for all who believe. He's not saying that under the law, you had to keep, under the law of Moses, you had to keep, or uh, yeah, he's not saying you used to have to keep commandments, but in Jesus, you don't keep commandments anymore. Now salvation is by faith alone. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying you used to have to keep the law of Moses, but now you don't. Now, faith in Jesus is what saves. Circumcision or uncircumcision is immaterial. But faith in Christ Jesus, that matters. So this is the distinction that he is setting up and we should understand Paul the, where he is and get it. He's not saying uh, you used to have to obey, but in Jesus now we have faith alone. No, <laughs> it doesn't say that. It says you used to have to keep the law of Moses, but in Jesus, that's not so. Now, faith, salvation is for everyone who believes, verse 22, for there is no distinction all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as satisfaction by his blood to be received by faith. There's no distinction. When we say all have sinned and fall short, there's no distinction. What distinction do we mean? We mean there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile. Whether you're Jewish, whether you were raised in the church, or whether you are Gentile, uh, brought up in the world by atheists or idolaters, don't matter. All of us who have, you know, reached adulthood have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all need to be forgiven. 
We all need to obey the gospel of Jesus. We all need to be buried together with him in baptism for forgiveness of sins, no matter who we are or where we came from. All of sin, there's no distinction. All of sin to fall short, they're justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a satisfaction by his blood to be received by faith. That's verse 22. Righteousness of God comes through faith in Christ Jesus. To say that it is by faith and not by the law of Moses, that's accurate. You see, the, the works of the law of Moses are the opposite of faith in this case, because faith in Jesus is a different thing. But notice how the the 25th verse points out Jesus is put forward as satisfaction by his blood. His is the offering that satisfies, unlike the blood of bulls and goats that is available in the law of Moses. This is the distinction that he's making. You need to obey Jesus. His is the blood that can save, whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Gentile, everybody alike has the problem of sin. Everybody alike needs to obey the gospel. We all need the blood of Jesus for forgiveness, which is gotten by faith. Now, does faith manifest itself as a failure to comply with the commandments of God? No, it never has. Now we refer you out to James chapter 2 and to 1 John, all of it. You can't say that you serve God while you walk in darkness. You cannot serve God in the mind while the body does something else. No, that doesn't exist. But here in Romans, we're not talking about that. We're talking about whether you have to be Jewish or not. Do you have to be Jewish to be saved? No, you don't. That's what this is really talking about. Which is why he said at the 27th verse, well, then what becomes of our boasting? It's excluded. <laughs> As in, we have no reason to think more highly of ourselves than we think of the Gentiles. It's excluded by what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. It's excluded not by the law of Moses, but by the law of Jesus. We hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law of Moses. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Isn't he the God of the Gentiles too? Do you see what's happening there? And verse 29, I think, is a very important verse in your study because verse 29 doesn't make any sense if you think that verse 28 means you're saved by faith alone apart from works. No, that's not what it's saying. It's saying you're saved in the faith in Jesus Christ, not in the law of Moses. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Isn't he the God of the Gentiles too? Well, what's that got to do with anything? Well, if you're talking about the law of Moses, it has everything to do with it. The law of Moses is only for the Jews, not for the Gentiles. Is he the God of the Jews only or for the Gentiles too? Yes, it's for everybody. What is for everybody? Jesus is for everybody. Right? Acts 17, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. He has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through the man whom he has ordained giving the proof of that by raising him from the dead. That's what's happening. Yeah. We hold that one's justified by faith apart from the works of the law of Moses. Or is God the God of Jews only? Isn't he the God of Gentiles too? Yes, Gentiles too. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Uh, what does that mean? It means everybody 
who obeys the gospel, whether they are circumcised or whether they are uncircumcised, they are being saved through faith, meaning they're all being brought into the one, the faith of Christ Jesus. Do we overthrow the law of Moses by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law of Moses. So now we have something else to talk about. <laughs> Do we overthrow the law of Moses by this faith? That is, does Jesus come and overthrow Moses? No, on the contrary, we uphold it. So now he's going to tell you why this is a good thing for the Jews, who among them might be thinking, well, what about my law? What about my history, my, my heritage, my culture, the things that I was taught? Or they may be thinking, oh, this is bad news for me. All that I know is going away. I could understand that. Um, but, you know, it's nothing more than you expect for everybody else out there. <laughs> you know? <laughs> if, you know, if this person in, in the Baptist church or this person uh, who is an atheist is going to obey the gospel, they're going to turn their back on what their family taught them and what they were brought up to believe and to think and to know. They're turning their back on everything to serve God. So, you know, um, I think perhaps there is that temptation to think, yeah, but that's because they were wrong. <laughs> I know, but you know, they didn't ask to be born. I didn't ask to be born and neither did you. I mean, you know, um, it is what it is. You, you, you're brought into a situation and, and it might be a good one and it might be a bad one, but either way it doesn't matter because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all are justified in the same way by faith in Christ Jesus. God doesn't have grandchildren. I've heard it said. But we all come to the same place. We all need the same thing. So what about upholding the law? Well, he's saying, no, the law is actually good. There's nothing wrong with the law in and of itself. It's just that it's scaffolding and you don't need it anymore. The fullness is in Jesus. This is the, this is the meaning really. Um, and that's what he's about to go on and explain in the fourth chapter. Um, but I think that we need to stop for now because the topic is too large to cover. So we will get it at the next opportunity, the Lord willing. Um, the fourth chapter begins talking about Abraham. And when did Abraham get the nod, if you will? When, when did God consider him faithful? When was he pleased? And when did circumcision come? Um, where does its, what is its place in relation to the promises that were made to Abraham about becoming a father of many nations, about blessing the entire world through him? Those are the questions. And what Paul is doing is saying, look, if your idea is that we impose the law of Moses on the whole world, well, no, the law of Moses doesn't allow you to do that. It strictly forbids bringing in non-Israelites in many places. But the faith that is in Christ Jesus fulfills what was given to Abraham, arguably the father of all of these things. That's where he's going with this. So we will have to look at it at the next opportunity. I think that the 13th verse is probably the centerpiece of Romans 4. The promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law of Moses. It came through the righteousness of faith. That's the bottom line. So in Christ, our righteousness comes through faith, not through being Jewish in the law of Moses. And there's a whole lot of other things to talk about, which we will, the Lord willing. But this, I think, is the centerpiece. There is a promise. There is an inheritance. But it didn't come through the law of Moses. It came through the righteousness that is by faith.
He trusted God. And that's when he got this promise. And we also trust God. And that's when you can get that promise. You can get that salvation. And simple trusting faith, obeying the gospel of Jesus before it's too late. All right. Well, again, um, we are happy to help you um, to obey the gospel of Jesus if you realize that that is your need today. Repent, make things right with God by means of being buried together with Jesus in baptism, putting to death the old person of sin to be resurrected a new person in Christ Jesus. Then you are a Christian. Then you have the satisfying sacrifice of the blood of the Lord. That is the way to be saved, the way to go to heaven today. Are you, as a child of God today, someone who has not been living right? Repent, make things right with God. We will pray with you, we'll pray for you, that you might be restored to him in your service, because we're just trying to make it here. We're here for a short time. We spirit creatures are living in this flesh, and uh, this flesh is, uh, you know, slowly wearing out. <laughs> but the spirit lives on. We will continue to exist well beyond this for many, many years, for ages, millennia, uh, eternity. How will it be? Where will you be? Whom did you serve in your time of trial and testing? Let us pray with you and for you for strength, for encouragement, to build each other up. If you need our prayers, you need to obey the gospel. Let it be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected. <laughs>